Yeah, yeah. I was uh, five years old, and uh, and I, my mom took me to a movie, and I it was the first movie I ever saw. It was the first time I'd ever been in a movie theater, and it was um, it was in uh, July of 1977, and the movie was Star Wars, um, uh, which is which which is a hell hell of a hell hell of a way to see a movie, first movie. Um, uh, like every other five-year-old, well, like everybody else on the planet, I freaked out when I saw that movie. But um, I think what was a little different was that what got me was the music. Um, and my mom and dad wouldn't buy me any of the toys at first because I, I was trying to, I was supposed to be learning to swim at the YMCA and I was afraid to let go of the side of the pool and they told me that until I let go of the side I wouldn't get any Star Wars toys. So, uh, I, so and I was just too, I was going to die if I let go of the side so there was no Star Wars toys for me but they did agree and did buy me the soundtrack, the album, LP. And so every day all day and all night, I would listen to two records. One was the the Star Wars soundtrack, and the other one was the the movie of the film, the like the the audio soundtrack on the record. I think they called it the story of Star Wars. And so that was just that was my life. That was my world. Was listening to that music, and I just couldn't I just couldn't listen to it enough. And I remember being you know confused by the idea that it was in a different order or it was different in the movie than it was on the soundtrack. That used to really mess with my mind and I didn't understand what was going on there. But I would listen to it. And about six months later, we moved, this was, we were spending a year in St. Louis, Missouri. We moved, we moved back to Chicago where I'm from and where I was born. And we were in a bigger house. So they pulled a grand piano that apparently we had that was in storage. And they pulled that out. And I remember that they delivered it into the house. And I went right over to the piano and I started picking out the notes to the melody, and as soon as I had some success with that, this is afternoon, I'll never forget this, uh, like some sort of program started running, some sort of like, some light went on, and I walked right into the kitchen and I said, Mom, I want to take piano lessons. And, and I wanted to write music for movies. I wanted to do it right then. I wanted to make other people feel the way that Star Wars had made me feel. And of course she looked at me like she, she had no idea where that came from. But as luck would have it, we lived four blocks from a, a, a rather prestigious music conservatory in, in the Chicago area. And so she put me in the car, and we went down there, and I interviewed, and, uh, and they accepted me, and I began st studying classical music uh, right then. So I think I had just maybe turned six, or was about to turn six, when I started studying, uh, starting studying piano. And that was my goal right from the beginning. What happened when Star Wars came out will never happen again. It was a very unusual combination of a particular film at a particular point in time when a society was particularly ready for it. So, so you know, Star Wars was brought into people's lives probably more than it really deserved, you know. Uh, but it, but, but I mean, not that it wasn't a great film and that it didn't pioneer all kinds of things and change movie making and it did all that and the music was fantastic and all that but it was also people were so desperate and ready for it that it, that it, it, it just it has this other energy in the phenomenon about it such that such that not for any of the films with all the hype and hysteria that I've ever seen in the 30 years since then I've never seen anything like that I've never seen a movie in theaters every day for more than a year with lines around the block. I've never seen that and um, probably won't again. But, but, um, but so the music for that film is, um, is why I became a composer. It's what started my life, me on my life path. The impact on, I mean, who knows what, what movie my son will see that'll move him, but he, you know, it'll be something and it'll, it'll be relative to his experience. I think, uh, I mean, there's, there's, uh, I keep Star Wars stuff all around me. Um, people think I'm a giant Star Wars fan, and I, and I guess that's true. But it's, f it's a more accurate thing for me to say that I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a fan of, of the, the, the power of art, and especially of the combination of music and film. And so my favorite film happens to be Star Wars. But it, whatever it had been, if that was the film that made me want to do that, then that's what I would surround myself with. Because it's a, it's a constant reminder to me of, of the responsibility and the privilege and the potential for, for making a contribution through your art because, because of what it gave me. As a blanket statement, I utterly disagree with that. But I would also disagree with the blanket statement that, uh, that you know, 
that the music is supposed to draw attention to itself. The truth is, it's a you know, it's another. There's a great score. Uh, uh, certainly can do both to the director's discretion, um, where it it can underscore, it can move you and move the story and the drama along without you being aware of it, and it can also at those moments that we've been trained and seated and, and come to expect and looking forward to be there to lean on the thrill button when Indiana Jones comes over the hill. Um, those are uh, uh, you know too much of either and you, you, haven't, you haven't utilized the medium to its fullest. Um, just as it is with camera work. You know, not every, the camera doesn't always have to be moving. Sometimes it can be stationary and you watch the action and the actors. Uh, but sometimes dynamic camera motion is fantastic and interesting and, and so it's just it's just the same same sort of thing it's just a different dramatic language um, you know I uh, I think I think where it starts to get gray is in those areas where uh, music that isn't well executed maybe starts to step on things when it's supposed to be underscore because uh, it doesn't know how to be effective and underscore and sometimes music that isn't well uh, executed uh, isn't effective when it's brought out to shine in the in the forefront, and so those just come back to the craft, I think, and the material and the and the artist more so than the inherent use of it in the film. Um, yeah. But you know, one thing that I'm I'm because I've spent a lot of time in sound design, and um, and uh, as well, uh, for me, an important thing to remember is that there there was never such a thing as a silent film. In the early days, before there was audio, before there was sound effects and dialogue, there was a guy playing music in the theater. So, um, so this this particular medium was born um, on the on the template that even if you had silence, if all you had were pictures, that the music alone could tell the story, could tell you how to feel, could give you the heart and the emotional uh, through line to get you through that film. That's what that's what launched this. You know, as one of the primary forms of communication and entertainment we have to this day, some hundred plus years later. So, 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 music's certainly ability and potential to utterly carry the heart and the drama of a film, to me, is 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 a fact. Um, so, it, but that doesn't mean it needs to be wall to wall, and it doesn't mean it needs to be fighting with any of the other dramatic elements. It's a dance. It's a choreography. There's a synergy between that, the sound design, and silence. And um, you know, and good directors and good composers and sound designers, you know, know how to know how to dance like that. So, yeah, it's funny because um, the John Williams influence, John Williams influences. It's it's been you know again since. It's hard for me to ever know where his music stopped or and mine started. It was born of that. Obviously, when I first began, I wanted to be able to write in that idiom. But, but to be honest, I listened to as much Goldsmith and Horner and Silvestri, maybe more in my really when I was really setting out in writing, doing especially when I started writing big band stuff. I, I was mostly listening to Horner and Silvestri and Goldsmith. Um, and um, and and then there's a lot of big band and jazz influences in my work. Guys like uh, Russell Ferrante from the Yellow Jackets, or Bob Mincer, or John Fedchuk, um, big these big band composers. There's uh, so much of their stuff is in is in my work to this day. Um, and maybe it's just you know not as obvious as because uh, a lot of my orchestral and orchestrational devices started on that Williams template and I think that's what gets people going oh that's like Williams and a lot of the turnarounds but 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 I didn't learn until I was in college that 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 Johnny was a was a was a jazz session piano player I didn't know that I didn't know anything about the man I mean you'd think but I didn't know anything about it and I was a jazz session player at the time that I found that out and and I remember when I learned that I mean I was like it made it made something made a lot of sense about it because he uses that in his work so much. It's so much in there in so many ways, right down to the voicings. They lay out on the keyboard with your hands in a very jazz piano kind of way, and and I wondered, and I'll never know of chicken and egg. Was I drawn to those jazz harmonies and big band writing because I somehow sensed that, or was that sensibility in there, and that's why I like Williams' stuff? 
I don't know what I don't know, but I know that that's a lot of what people, you know, point out when they when they hear that influence in my work. But I mean, uh, but man, I've stolen as much stuff from Horner as I've stolen from Williams, <laughs> for sure. In, in my mind, you know, Silvestri is a uses the minimalist approach to the same thing that Williams does. They're both they both want to give you that anchor, um, and and but Williams wants to go with a whole other level of development and Silvestri is more content to really let that sit um, that's how I just sort of feel about it and Goldsmith is somewhere in the middle and Horner's somewhere in the middle because Horner's always you know quoting Shostakovich and stuff so you can tell you know so um, so but um, huge influences and who, who else did I used to listen to uh, oh gosh I mean well, the occasional thing from Bruce Browden would just blow me away. I, Tombstone is so... Um, I love Tombstone. I love that score. Um, oh, man. Um, and, uh, well, of course, uh, Ennio with, uh, with uh, Untouchables, great score, huge impact on me. Um, what other ones were... Uh, but, it was, look, it was, it was a lot of... It's like anything else. You know, you just... I would follow what I li listened to, and... And to this day, I mean, I, in the 80s, I was, playing in, I was playing synth and rock bands and pop cover bands. I was in the jazz ensemble, and I played percussion section in the orchestras and symphonies and stuff. Um, but, but, you know, uh, but I loved pop. That's what I listened to. I was a kid. I mean, so I wasn't listening. I didn't go home and listen to jazz as much as I would listen to whatever, Phil Collins or whatever. So it's all, it's all in there, man. It's just it's all in there somewhere. I mean, it's funny. When, if I say Thomas Newman... We all have a sound immediately that goes off in our head. It's something in that Shawshank venue. But that's not how I met Thomas Newman. Thomas Newman, for me, were those comedies like Revenge of the Nerds and Real Genius, which, which were great little appropriate scores that have nothing to do with, with Thomas Newman today. You know, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, those things remind me that, you know, sometimes you know, you can start one way and, and get into a niche in some other way. I, 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 speaking of Newman's, I've always loved David Newman's work, always loved it. Um, you know, he's really adept and he knows how to do a lot of good styles and stuff. I, there's a lot of great, a lot of great uh, work has, has, has certainly been heard from in the last 30 years, way above Williams, that's for sure. He's not the only guy, <laughs> you know what I mean? My formal training came after all my real training. Um, my formal training organized all of the stuff that I really knew, which you can't teach in school. Um, and I would, if my, any student that comes to me, if my son has any, you know, predilections in this area, for sure the way I learned was, um, I, I studied scores, but I was studying scores early so that I could figure out, so I, to develop my ear. I didn't really realize what I was learning at the time. I just wanted to learn, like, well, what are those chords and what are those things? And, but I was reading these scores. My jazz director used to give me this, the, the big band charts. And so I would go home and I would listen to these big band tunes that I loved, and I would work on transcribing them to work on my ear. But what was happening was I was learning the art of orchestrating for big band without even really meaning to. Um, and, and I would learn the way my ear would get confused, and I would hear a particular voicing, and after the 10th, 12th, 15th score, I'd be like, you know what, I know how that's voiced, because it's always like this, and it usually is. So I started to learn the idiom of writing for saxes, the idiom of writing for trombones, stuff that, you know, the guys who were really good would just tend to do. And I would start to learn tricks based on that, and it was developing my ear. And then at my school, I was just constantly writing things, and I would just put them on the stands. I would just write something for a friend of mine who would, you know, a sax player or a flute player. And because they're high school kids, they mostly suck at what they do. So what I was learning was how to make even a high school kid sound good on his instrument, which means learning where the, where, where, where the, the most comfortable places are for that instrument, you know, how to, how to write music so, so that they don't get all tripped up and distracted by the time signature or the, the rhythm. How can I coax the thing that's in my head out of this 16-year-old kid um, was... was was a, a uh, that's that's where I was that was my training, 
So for, for learning the basics of orchestration, that's where that started from, from Big Ben, right, right, studying the scores. And then I just amped that up when I came out here. That's what all that work with Warner Bros. did. I just took it to the next level. Okay, well, I've written for small orchestras. I've written for you know, this level of players. Let's do the same thing, only now what I'm putting on the stands is the hardest shit I can think of, and for all world-class players, let's see, let's see what that does. I stayed in touch with my college professor, uh, 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 and he's now my conductor and has been for 20 years, one of my best friends in the world, knows my music better than anybody. So I ended up studying privately with him after I left USC. But what, what he was doing um, was organizing. I would say, listen, I always do this, I always do this, I always do this. And I know if I can't do this, I can do this. And I know if I can't do this. And then I would say, well, what, why, how come this works? And he would say, well, I'll tell you why, because you've got this common tone and you can use this as a pivot. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, cool. All right. I just always wondered. And that was what our that's what our things were like. And in that moment, the the confirmation that he would give me and the and the cementing of the idea locked some things in place and gave me confidence about certain things, but but it, it would not be accurate to say I learned a lot. I mostly had my learning organized into nice. Somebody came in and cleaned up my closet. And um and that's the process by which I still learn and by which I recommend people learning. My favorite things to learn at orchestral sessions are not necessarily things like what voicing and what doubling, because those, those are, are, that's not what's, that's not the mystery. It's really, orchestration is not, I mean, it's the deepest of sciences and there's a million levels to it, um, but there's a certain point where I can put down an orchestration and I know it's going to be fine. It's not going to be, it's going to work. It's going to be fine. And unless I'm very specifically, unless I'm very specifically and deliberately trying to do some experimental level of orchestration, um, getting that Hollywood sound or whatever, that's not, the, the, the thing that I learn in sessions, which is, is, is richest to me, is about getting what's on the page out of the people in the room. That to me is harder because it is more, because you can have a great orchestration and two orchestras can play it completely differently and one it can have the sparkle and one it can be nothing. And, and that is a very careful balance about, about working and interacting with people and, and a psychological manipulation game of how you notate something and how much direction you give or don't give um, and, and the way in which you rehearse it uh, to get people on board with, with what's going on in your mind. Um, and the communication and shorthand that you have with your conductor. It's why I don't conduct. Um, I'm not qualified to conduct. I've seen a world-class conductor and I don't have those chops yet. And, and I know that until I do, I won't stand on that podium. And I know how, because I know how important, how transformative that is. So the things you know, that I've learned um, at sessions are, are more, more along the lines of, of the way in which I relate and talk to the musicians and the way in which I present um, uh, the, the material. Well, I can tell you, here's like one little thing. I'm one of the only guys left, I may be the only guy, I think is what they told me last time, who writes transcribed, uh, transposed scores. I, 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 that's how I was trained, that's how I see. It bothers me to see a, a score in C. But, oh, okay, but, uh, uh, but, what's interesting is, at the level of musicianship, all these guys, these musicians tend to take themselves very seriously at this level, a lot of symphonic players. And the people along the chain, the copyists and all that, they actually treat the work and they treat me differently because there's some sort of legitimacy they feel about me just based on the fact that I, I can actually do a transposed score. And the individual, the individual players have this sense that maybe this guy actually knows how to write for the French horn and not for a French horn. You know, uh, um, uh, the, the, the players know that I can orchestrate myself. A couple of cases they have seen me stand on the podium, take out a pencil, and just quickly re-orchestrate re a chord or a moment. And those moments m change the attitude in the room. Um, um, be, 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 because they, they, they say, okay, this guy actually knows what he's doing. And what they witness is a lot of, not necessarily that. They see a lot of composers who don't have orchestrational cho orchestration chops and they can sense that, so he gets nervous and embarrassed if something doesn't work, and there's lots of times tantrums and fights and people yelling and all kinds of shit going on in these sessions. Um, yeah, I, I've never had any of that in my sessions, and very, very, I come in and prepare it, and I come in because I've just, 
Because the musicians, honestly, have taken the time to let me know that, that it affects them, to let them know that makes a difference. You know, it's all, now it's all in confidence. Oh, like, you know, I just want to tell you, I really appreciate this work. You know, we got to play a lot of shit, you know, and this is really, it's nice to finally have some decent stuff. They'll say that kind of thing. They're desperate to say that sort of thing. I don't have to do a thing. I write parts that are going to be fun to play. I write them uh, uh, deliberately in good ranges on their instruments. I know their breathing patterns. I know what the things that drive them fucking crazy are. I know, I know what they are. And so I give them, so, you know, I used to sit in the percussion section and count measures, rests for 60 measures. That drove me fucking crazy. I hated it. It wasn't fun. I was sitting there with a timpani, and, boom, and that was it after another 15 minutes. I hated that. So my memories of that very much guide the orchestration as I'm thinking about my friends in the room and giving them cool stuff to do. And, you know, not, not for its own sake, but I make sure that that's in there. And that changes the way the music comes out. The attitude in the room is different. They perform the music better. Um, you know, more, that's m way more what you learn than four horns or six horns, or, you know, it's better if their bells are up, or, I mean, or, or double this or double that. I, 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 it's real straight. I ne one thing I don't do, I never stripe. I never stripe. I never will. Uh, Sean and I had a long discussion about that. You know, his feeling on it is that there's sometimes there's a call for that. Sometimes there's a point where that makes sense. Generally, he doesn't like to do it. The reason neither of us really like to do it is because the musicians fucking hate it. They hate it. They hate it. They hate it. Um, because they're trained to play together as a unit, to play off of each other, to, to feel the thing. And, and they just sit, they just, they, they, that's all. I've never heard a musician bitch like they bitch when they talk about striping sessions. So that's one thing I learned. It's one thing I learned. They hate that. Don't do that. And you don't need to if you really know what you're doing. And, um, and, and if you're writing the music in the idiom that I write, a lot of today's music is, is, is vertical. It's about layers and patches and stuff that sound design is in there. It's, a, it's created in the mix it, it more than in the room. In which case, yeah, stripe, because this is only going to be chopped up into samples anyway. What's the, what's the difference? But that's just not the idiom of stuff that I write. I write these sort of, you know, symphonic cues that are performances. So, you know, that's the stuff I've learned mostly. Yes, they can, they can have their own things to say. They will have their own things to say. You're your own person, and you are the, more than the sum total of your influences, but all of your influences are out there and in there such that your work cannot help but be uh, um, personal. Um, certainly not for, you can't copy somebody for very long. Um, you'll run out of chords and progressions, and, and, you know, and I've been writing music you know, professionally for, I don't know, 25, 26 years. Um, so, um, I, I know when I listen to my own work, um, I know what things I tend to do that I do more than anybody else or in particular ways. There's voicings and turnarounds and particular structural stuff. Um, you know, uh, so I, I know, I can recognize my stuff. I, uh, um, and people who know my work really well and know, know all the different type of stuff that I do can hear stuff in my jazz stuff that shows up and, uh, you know, they can hear it. They can hear it. Um, but, um, but, I, but I'm also, uh, you know, I, I, I've also been hearing, oh, it sounds like John Williams. I've been hearing that since I was 12. Like, like I don't fight that. Uh, that's, uh, there's obviously plenty of that in there. Um, and, um, and for some people, especially when they're real obsessed with the, um, the idea that, that, that the contribution to be made is one where your sound is like nobody else's, well then, you know, the 99% of the people who are working right now should stop because they sound like Hans Zimmer, so it's over. Um, um, w and I think all of that is bullshit. I think if you love Hans Zimmer, study Hans Zimmer until, until, you, until you could become Hans Zimmer. And then you'll go past it because you'll, cause you're not Hans Zimmer. Uh, and you'll find something else on the way. And if you love John Williams, study John Williams until, you know, until you're like, I know what he's going to do. And it's true. I mean, at this point, after 30 years of study, I can usually tell you a couple bars ahead what he's probably going to do, because he's he's not he's amazing, but he's also got his things that he likes. A Horner, espe well, Horner especially, they all have things that, that you know you do. So, um, you know, if you if if uh, if I listen to or if somebody listens to five film scores, you're not going to miss you're not going to miss you're not going to miss what uh, w w what I do. 
And it doesn't all sound like Williams. I just get accused of that a lot. But um, you know, nobody ever says that about the stuff that I write that doesn't. They don't ever talk about that. But that's all right. Um, but again, that's a hard. That's a hard. You know, I don't have. I, it's hard for me to get upset when people say it sounds like Williams. I don't care whether they mean it as a slam or not. Uh, you know, it's just it's good company to be in. But that's you know, that's 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 the beginning of the of the process is being inspired, and then you want to do what you just saw, and then you make it your own. You don't worry about it too much. I've witnessed something happen in music that I witnessed happen in visual effects 15 years ago. I, it's the identical, identical process. And, and, um, and just to stick in the music, talk about the music, what, what has changed about the sound of a score today versus those scores that I grew up on, and they're of completely different ilks, um, is not the sound. Everybody thinks the sound is what's different. The sound has changed. The sound has somewhat evolved, but it's not all radically new. We're still using orchestras and, and, and percussion instruments, and it's not the sound. It's the structure. That's what's changed. Um, uh, um, you know, what, th the way I describe it is that today's music is vertical. The music that I grew up and was trained to do was horizontal. Um, um, today, a film score will be a collection of cues, each one of which may be, is perfectly appropriate for the scene. It works in the scene. It's cool on its own. Nobody's got anybody, it, 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 but it tells no long developing story. It no longer follows the dramatic structure, um, um, which music always did. And it, it followed the same structure as the screenplay did. It was a symphonic, long-form piece that developed over, you know, 80 minutes, 90 minutes, whatever it was, that th the beautiful part of the art of which that it managed to do that, have its own entirely self-supporting structure. It could be listened to on its own and you would hear the story, and yet it still managed to be serving a picture and an edit. It can do both those things, it can juggle those things, yeah, and the whims of a director. That's amazing that it did all those things at once. Um, uh, but, again, the way I was trained was long form. It was symphonic developing. It was about coming up with themes and ideas that you could mine for 90 minutes and not have to just repeat them or ostinato them or do it. I mean, you've got to have something more to say, kid. You've got another 75 minutes to go. And, and that is the world of symphonic writing. That training has essentially disappeared. That, those inspirations have essentially disappeared. So what we're hearing today, the difference is music that, 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 that doesn't develop. But there's nobody complaining about it because it's fucking cool. And it works for the scene. What's the problem? But that's also, um, uh, but, but, but the films have changed too. They, they now have, the, frequently, these films now follow these things called six-act and sometimes eight-act structures. That's all new. It's been a three-act structure since the day of, like, like, since the Greek dramas, since Aristotle. The dramatic form had not changed. So that suddenly changed. And you've seen these movies where it's like the whole movie seems to build up to a point you think it's over, but that's only the halfway point of the movie. It's like a whole second movie happens. This is a thing. So structure is changing. Um, and as a result, it's bringing a different type of people into the composing. It's, it's bringing people who are interested in the vertical layers, the thing on top of a thing on top of a thing, a thing that's more got a pop music sensibility in the way it's mixed, that's got a lot of sound design elements in it. Um, um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, it's all, but it's also why everything needs to be epic now. Because when you, when you don't have a story that keeps evolving, you know, and going places and keeping you engaged, you've got to keep it, it's got to keep grabbing you. Um, um, and so, you know, well, bigger and, and like, you know, it's, it's just, there's just this never ending pursuit of more epic um, because all of the other little micro emotions require a shit ton of training and experience and practice to get to. So um, that's the difference between the sound of a score today. The the toms and the choir and all the and the da 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 da, -da, -da and all those things that are on every fucking score somehow now. The, the, that's not actually what's different. It's um it's just we've it's a different breed of composer, without with a different skill set. Um, when we hear Horner try to do Amazing Spider-Man, where you can just hear somebody going, well, let's put more Zimmer in it. He doesn't know what to do with that, and he hates it, and you can feel it on that score. You can feel it. 
and, 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 and it's, they're from different worlds. And Hans said to me once that he thinks that today's films reject themes. That was his exact words. He said, I think today's films, they, they reject this thematic work. He told me, because we were having this discussion about it, um, and he was saying that he doesn't think it's not that there aren't a whole lot of people who can write as well as John Williams. It's just that the, the movies don't call for that kind of work. Now, I actually don't agree with him at all. But, but, I, but I know where he's coming from. Because certainly the films are different. You'd really have to, it would be difficult to, to, to write a, 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 let's call it a Williams-esque or an 80s-esque um, through line for the kind of films that they're cutting today, even the way they cut them. You don't even have a locked picture anymore. That's really, that used to be part of it. You needed to know where the transitions were going to be. So you could do those beautiful sweeps and change the emotions that happen through like those great moments in Star Wars that make it operatic. Well, you know, even the prequels weren't locked. And Williams' music does not fit in the prequels the way it fit in the other movies. There's lots of great movement, great moments in them, but there there are cues that were music edited into them, and you can feel it. That magic Johnny line is not in there, and that it's not in there, and it's in there because that's not how they're cutting the films. So so maybe Hans is right in that way. Is that you know if the films are rejecting it, it's for a lot of reasons other than um, you know just. Uh, that uh, that people can't do it, I mean, uh, or can do it and aren't, but that, that maybe there is something structurally in there. But for sure, um, um, it's uh, it's 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 a lot it's a lot of layers and th and that sort of thing and and interesting ideas which then go to an interesting idea which then go to an interesting idea and the whole scenes all the scenes work. So what's the problem? Well, I guess there's no problem. The movies are making hundreds of billions of dollars and nobody cares. But. Um, um, uh, I, these scores will not endure for 40 years. I absolutely will put my reputation on the line and say that like the pop music that's listened today, like a lot of art that is to today, longevity is no longer an interested commodity. Nobody cares if it's going to be around in 40 years. Just move on to the next meme. Move on to the next 140 character bit. It's just shorter and more disposable. It's, it's the whole culture, our whole thing, and I think there's You'd be naive to think that that wouldn't work its way into music, and um, so uh, so you know they're selling out concerts right now uh, tonight to go hear Johnny play uh, fucking J Jaws. Are they going to do that uh, for a film that's coming out next week? A film that's coming out next week? Are they going to play that score to sold out audiences in 40 years? I'd be real surprised. And it's not because it isn't cool, and it isn't because it isn't effective. It's because in the end. Um, you know, to, 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 to really get in to people and become a part, that transformative part of their lives, you've got to actually have something substantive to say and there's no shortcut to that. You've got to learn that skill. You've got to study that skill. It can't all be fortune cookies. Sometimes you've got to read a novel. And writing a novel is different than writing a, a quote for a, a, a Hallmark card or a tagline for a movie. They're different, they're different, different arts. I hear stuff come out of, the, uh, out of a remote control that's fucking cool. I mean, I just, I still like cool, man. I don't know. I don't care what it's for. I, you know, he's got teams of people working on it, and then here's the biggest Tom you've ever heard, and it's like this huge, like, that's fucking great. I love that. And then those mixes, those super dense mixes that, that he comes up with, uh, that, that don't cross the wall of sound thing, that everything is blaring, but it's got clarity and focus. That's a technological marvel. Um, so, so I can't look at that. And, um, and, and, and go, well, this is all just shit. I, I can't. I respect it. And I respect Hans too much. And, um, and, and um, you know, and, uh, but, but he's been very cool to me, and we've had discussions about it, and, and we're very clear that we're from different cloths and in the way which, in which different cloths. And, um, you know, he didn't ask to be the template for everything. But, man, he, he, you know, he is. And uh, that's how that goes. So... Uh, you know, so so it just for for me and for people like me, it just it's just a call to, okay, well, you have a choice. You're either going to do Zimmer, or I guess you're going to find other places to do what you do. Which is, it's up to you. I I think it's much harder, and it's because that's the downside of it. The homogenization of all this sound and the fact that it's always like the ostinato strings, the big giant toms, the occasional shout choir, and the, I mean, like, everybody, every piece sounds like that, and they all sound like it's almost it's almost the same piece of music over and over. The 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 the, the, the advantage of where of where this vertical production has gone is that it has invited people who otherwise have very little in the way of musical training or or or, or chops 
has allowed them to participate in the creative game. It is just the way as, I don't know, Final Cut Pro or whatever. You know, all these technologies promised to make artists out of, you know, that, that's, what these, that's what the whole Apple revolution is about. Like, like, yeah. like once you had YouTube and, and Final Cut Pro, we'd find out that there was actually Spielbergs everywhere. Well, no, we didn't. It's not how it turned out. It turns out there's still only a few Spielbergs and a few Scorseses. And, and, and you know, and we, we, but we found more. And we found different type of stuff. So I think the same thing has happened in music. A lot of people are in music, call themselves composers, who don't know anything about music, don't have any music theory, don't play an instrument, don't, I mean, you know, but that it's very difficult for me to understand how we're both music, how, well then what am I? If you're a musician and you don't do, how, am I, how are we both musicians? What, so, but, but, but those are also the people who've taken it places that I couldn't have ever taken it. Uh, but the downside of all those people is that it's this homogenization. It's very difficult to make your mark and stand out because, because, because it's not so much about what you have to say, it's how you say it. That's kind of what it is now. It's mostly production driven, you know, and, and it's not about the like unbelievable harmonic and, and evolution and the story, the, 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 the inherently compelling and passionate, this is not what it's about. It's about, that's fucking cool, and that's fucking cool, well, that's great, that's awesome, this is all great. It's just like, everything's cool and awesome, and it's loud, and it's, all, and it's huge, and it's going to build, and I think it makes it difficult when everybody's doing that, and everybody's doing it kind of well. I would not want to be a kid coming up today, no fucking way. Uh, um, um, but, but it's just a more intense version of, of some truth that I had to face, which is, well, I guess you're just going to have to network more, and, and a lot more, because... You can't just do half network, half demo tape. Now you got to do 90% because your demo tape sounds like everybody has a demo tape. But now get in those, get to those, get to those parties and get to those uh, things. I mean, I, I think th it's probably just more of that. Um, so, you know, so I mean, I have advice for people that I talk about in terms of marketing yourself and, and, and getting yourself and out there and doing all that. But, but it's a very different, it's a completely different world than it was when I was coming up. And, um, and I don't know anybody from my generation or older that doesn't say that. Um, so the landscape is diff diff difficult, you know, uh, but uh, hey, man, uh, that, that uh, you know, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. You want to evolve, you want this art to change, you want it to go places, well, you're going to have to break some molds. So we don't do business the way we used to, we don't write music the way we used to, we don't use the same kind of instruments we used to, uh, the things are going to change. And the, this is part of the new paradigm is, is um, there's a sea of people with demos and SoundCloud pages, you know? So, yeah. So, more, more, more networking. But that doesn't stop me. I'm still teaching the old stuff. 